Good. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's lovely to be here. And for those who don't know, I, Tony, I live down the road. Um, uh, I uh, minister at Hope Church, which is further down Old Bedford Road. And it's a privilege to be, be here. Um, do you want to, there we go. So, what I, I felt to chat to you about, if, if you will let me, is a bit about differences, uh, prejudice, um, but based around um, the parable of the Good Samaritan. But, but just to set the scene before we get into the parable of Good Samaritan, which most of you will know, I'm sure, but we'll see if I can bring some extra light to it to help you in your understanding of it. What you may not be aware is that in terms of the New Testament, Samaritans are almost exclusively uh, in Luke. So there's in John's Gospel, John chapter 4, the, uh, the woman at the well in Samaria. But all the other instances, there's nothing in Matthew nothing in Mark, all the instances about Samaritans are either in Luke's Gospel or the Acts of the Apostles, which Luke also wrote. And they're quite um, regular in terms of their occurrence. And the Samaritans were people who were hated by the Jews. And there's all sorts of history, which I won't go into, of conflict between Jews and Samaritans, whereby they both looked down on each other and saw and thought each other were uh, less than they ought to be. And Luke uses the Samaritan throughout his gospel and in the Acts of the Apostles to challenge and talk about prejudice that the Jews had towards the Samaritans. And in particular, the message that he's trying to get through and throughout his gospel and the Acts of the Apostles is that the gospel isn't just for the Jews, it's for the whole world. But unless they can deal with their prejudice, there's no way that can happen it becomes an obstacle and a barrier to the spread of the gospel. And that's obviously true. And the challenge for us, the challenge for me, is our prejudging, particularly our prejudging of other people, can be a major obstacle to the gospel. And the centerpiece, as you're probably aware, on... Luke's dealing with the Samaritans is the parable of the the Good Samaritan, which is well known, but it's actually only there in Luke. It's not in the other Gospels. And in the context of the Samaritans, one would presume that the heart, the message of the parable of the Good Samaritan is to do with prejudice. That's what you'd expect. And what I've realized, I've Over a number of years now of living in Luton, what I've been challenged on is my prejudices. And if you'd have asked me a a while ago, I'd have said, I'm not prejudiced. But I realise I am. And I've learned a lot about my own prejudices and it's helped me see and understand the power of the Good Samaritan different ways and I hope it might be helpful for you too. So, there we go. So, that's where we've talked to and then straight into the parable itself. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus Teacher, he asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What should I do? And the first thing which you may or may not have noticed is that he's asking the wrong question. You don't do anything to inherit eternal life. 
And it's one of the things that first has to hit us as we become Christians and follow Jesus. It's not what we do. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. And the danger is that we come with the same preconceptions as this expert of the law. So when we read the parable of the Good Samaritan, we are caught up in his worldview, which is, it's all about doing. And so therefore we read the parable of the Good Samaritan as telling us what we should do. We should help people. But we know that actually being a Christian is not about what we do, it's about who we are, it's our attitude. So my, my friend, you know, uh, Steve Moody, he, he's at Stopsley Baptist Church, he, he talks about how Frank Sinatra gets it wrong. So Frank Sinatra, towards the end of his singing career, his memory had gone a bit and he used to forget the words. And so he would sort of add in, dooby dooby do just to cover the fact he couldn't remember what the words were. And what Steve says, it's wrong. It's not do be do be do, it's be then do. Be then do, not do then be. So the Good Samaritan story isn't primarily about challenging our actions about what we do. It's about our attitude. And it's not just Samaritans throughout Luke's gospel and the Acts of the Apostles, but also it's in chapter 10. Chapter 10, the context of the Good Samaritan is all about prejudice. There we go, there we go. So, the other things that are included in chapter 10, which you can check in your Bibles when you go home, is first... It's the sending out of the 70. And the sending out of the 70 is mirroring the 70 nations that were there in Genesis chapter 10, the Tower of Babel. So that sense of sending out 70, 70 is symbolic of the nations. And then Tyre and Sidon, which is really quite a powerful statement, is saying that Tyre and Sidon, which were Gentile towns, they weren't part of Israel, and is saying that they're more honourable than, so, yeah, more honourable than the Jewish towns of Cherazin and Bethsaida. And so, actually, in that incident, we have almost a prerequisite. It's, it's almost a taster, a sniff of the parable of the Good Samaritan. In that story, it's the same thing about actually these nations, these towns which you look down on, they are better than you. And then after the parable of the Good Samaritan, there's the incident of Mary and Martha. You know the instance where um, Mary is in the kitchen no, no, Martha's in the kitchen, isn't she? Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet. And Martha says, you ought to, to tell uh, Mary to come and help me. And the issue there is really about prejudice. It's about prejudice. A woman's place is in the kitchen. And Jesus is saying, no, she's found something better. Actually, it's not about being in the kitchen where women ought to be and men sitting to the teacher. That's prejudice. She's doing and chosen the right thing. So the whole of chapter 10 is about prejudice. And so you'd have expected, therefore, the parable of the Good Samaritan in its context, in the total context, to be about prejudice, which is a barrier to reaching the world. And prejudice is about our attitude. It's not about our actions. It's how we think about things. So, let's carry on with the parable. What is written in the Lord? As Jesus replying, how do you read it? The, the expert in the law answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. 
You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? When you're sort of challenged about things, it's very good to come up with another question, isn't it? It deflects things. Who is your neighbour? What he's really asking is about responsibility. He wants clear boundaries. Are you like that? Lots of people, they like to know what their boundaries are. What he's saying, who am I responsible for? If I'm to love my neighbour, give me the boundaries. Who is my neighbour? Let me know. Who am I responsible for? Or, probably, where does my responsibility end? Now, I'm leading a local church, as I said. You've got Tim coming to, to join you in a couple of weeks. One of the key questions in terms of church leaders in the church is, or a church, who am I responsible for? Who is Tim responsible for? Or as a church, if you look at who is our target group? Who are we looking to reach? Who am I responsible for? Is Tim responsible? Am I responsible for the people who turn up at my church on a Sunday morning? Is it the wider group of people associated some way with the church? Is it a certain group of people in Luton? Is Tim responsible for the people who live in the Bushmead estate? Is he responsible, for, are you responsible just for those who are open and receptive to the gospel? Is it the whole of Luton? Who are we responsible for? They're important questions. And different experts will all tell me the importance of the question, but then will give me different answers. And many of those experts are members of my congregation. <laughs> and I guess many of the experts here are members of the congregation. It's an important question, is it? Who am I responsible for? Who are we responsible for? And you will have your own ideas. That's what the expert of the law was asking. And Jesus then tells the story. And just to get it in perspective, that's where Galilee is, and the bottom is Samaria, and then there's Jericho and Jerusalem. That's just so that you can see. Because we use these terms, and they're real terms, real places in Israel. Okay? And so, when he says, in reply, who am I responsible for? He talks about this journey from Jericho to Jerusalem, with Samaria being the area between Judea, which is where Jericho and Jerusalem are, and Galilee, where Jesus came from. Okay? Remember that picture? Good. So, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, as you saw on that map before, Jerusalem to Jericho, it's actually 17 miles between one and the other, and it's mostly desert. And the whole of that road and that area was notorious for bandits. And so it's not surprising a man on that journey would be beaten up by bandits. And the important thing is he was stripped and left half dead. And they're going to turn out to be important as we go through the parable. A priest happened to be going down on the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Good news. Beaten up guy, stripped, half dead. There's a priest there. What's he going to do? He's coming off his two-week shift from Jerusalem, serving in the temple. 
He'll have his donkey. He'll have his tithes. He'll have money. He is the ideal person to be able to help the beaten up man. But he has four dilemmas. There are four obstacles for those who know the situation that will stop him from helping. The first is boundaries, which we talked about. Who is my neighbour? It's about boundaries. Is he responsible for the man or not? The man's naked. So the priest can't be sure of his nationality. If he's one of us, if he's a Jew, then I'm obliged to help him. But if he's a foreigner, I have no duty, no responsibility towards him at all. So there is a real dilemma there about boundaries. Am I responsible for this man or not? And there's no way that he can know. But it's not just boundaries. There's also personal risk. The man's half dead. Which means he might be dead. He might not be. If he's dead and I touch him, I'll become ceremonially unclean. And I'll have to return to Jerusalem. There'll be a sense of shame with it. There'll be a two-week process of me being cleansed and being clean again. And I've just come off a massive shift and I'm going home. He's more concerned about his own purity than about mercy. The risk to him is too high. And the significance is that in the law, to be un- you're not allowed to come within two meters of a dead body or else you become unclean. So two meters, one, two. Which is the reason why he went to the other side of the road to walk past. He wanted to make sure that he didn't go within two meters of the dead body. Now you can say, wow. What a holy man. He was such a stickler for keeping the law that he even made sure that he wasn't within two meters of what may or may not be a dead body so he didn't become unclean. So there's boundaries, there's personal risk. There's also sacrifice or, to put it more colloquially, the donkey dilemma. It's good to have alliteration, isn't it? So there's the donkey dilemma. The priest is riding on a donkey. Rich people don't walk. They have donkeys. If he helps this guy, he's going to have to get off his donkey and allow the injured man to get on the donkey. Or he'll have to leave some of his stuff behind. He could have helped. He's got the resources to help. But the cost is far too high. And then finally, there's suspicion. Maybe he's faking it. Maybe he's going to rob me. The suspicion dilemma. Maybe he's going to take advantage of me. There's a a saying in the Middle East, from mercy comes abuse. You don't help people because they'll take advantage of you. Have you heard the, the British saying, give them an inch and they'll take a mile. So he had four reasons, four dilemmas, which is the reason why he walked by on the other side and would have justified himself. He was doing the right thing. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side as well. Now, Levites don't have the same purity rules as priests. Priests are high up on the pecking order. Levites are pretty low down. You can't touch a dead body whilst on duty, but there's no problem if you're not on duty. 
And being a Levite, he won't have a donkey, but at least he could have administered some first aid. Oh. Yeah, there we go. Maybe the Levite saw the priest pass by. He's ahead of him, sees the priest walk by on the other side. Well, if he passed by and he's right up here, then so shall I. He doesn't want to shame the priest. If he helped and the priest didn't, it will make the priest look bad. If my leaders don't do it, then I shouldn't. Does that happen in church? Your leaders act in a certain way and you think, well, if I do it, then I'm going to make my leaders look bad. It takes a lot of courage to take the initiative. You don't know whether it's okay or not. And if leaders don't do it, why should you take the risk? You don't want to embarrass the priest. And talking about, about responsibility, who am I responsible for? Initiative is part of taking responsibility. If no one else is doing it, it's very hard to break new ground. And that's a quote from Albert Einstein. Few people are capable of expressing opinions which differ from the prejudices of their social environment. Most people are not even, in, are, are even incapable of forming such opinions. In terms of prejudice, if everyone else thinks this, everyone else does that, well, we'll do the same. So it's not surprising the Levite passes by as well. The next verse in the parable is the big shock and the surprise. Up until now, this had been and would have been heard of as an ordinary story. You have an ordinary story with heroes. So, you've, so they're expecting, okay, there's the priest, the Levite, and now the hero of the story will be the ordinary Jew. Working through, okay, there's the priest up here, there's the Levite, they do things wrong. Now the ordinary Jew, he's going to do everything right. But then, utter shock, anger from the people listening to the story because... He goes on, but a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. In the normal story, an Englishman, Irishman, and a Scotsman. <laughs> Priest, Levite, an ordinary Jew. The ordinary Jew does something. That's what they're expecting to say. So when he says Samaritan as the hero, and they could perceive him as being the hero, because that's how these stories play out, you can feel the crowd getting angry. What's he doing in our story? We don't have Samaritans in our stories. <laughs> and what's he doing on that road? You saw the map. Samaritans live in Samaria, which is to the north. What's a Samaritan doing on this road in the middle of Judah? There shouldn't be any Samaritans on our road. And he had compassion. What the Jewish leaders didn't do, this Samaritan did. How dare you? How dare you bring that into this story? It's like, for example, a Catholic priest passed by. An Orthodox priest didn't help. And then you'd say, ah, but the Anglican priest, Tim, walked by and he helped. But no... You expect it to be the Anglican priest, but no, it's a Pakistani imam who is walking by, and he's the one who stopped and helped. 
But it's not just the fact that he stopped and helped, but the word pity, compassion, pity, the actual Greek word is a word that is in the Bible uniquely used of God. Spagmotza is also used of Jesus. It's saying a churning of the bowels. It's talking about a deep gut level compassion which in the Bible is reserved just for God. It's never used of an ordinary person, but it's now being used of a Samaritan. So you have these two surprises. Firstly, it's a Samaritan, and then secondly, he's showing compassion. And he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The Samaritan is going to undo all the problems in this story, one by one. He tears his own clothes to bind up his wounds. Uses his own expensive oil and wine. And pouring out oil and wine was part of worship. What the Samaritan does is actually worship. The prophets say what God really wants is not just the temple worship, but helping the broken. The Levite didn't take initiative or administer first aid. The Samaritan does both. He gets off his donkey, puts the guy on it, and walks in front of the donkey, which is what a servant does, which is what a slave does, which is what the priest couldn't see him bring himself to do. And he goes to an inn, I'm going ahead of myself now. Go back. You can go back. There we go. He goes to an inn, and the inn would have to have been in Jericho, because actually on this road, 17-mile road, it is desert, there weren't any inns. Now, I am told, if you go to uh, Israel now, the tour guide will take you to the inn of the Good Samaritan. And it's on the road between uh, Jerusalem and Jericho. But there's two problems that if you ever get to the situation, you might want to tell your tour guide. First of all, there were no inns on roads. There were only in towns. And secondly, this is a parable. It didn't really happen. (laughs) (laughs) So this, this inn of the Good Samaritan is a fabrication, a fiction to... For gullible tourists. But Jericho, oh, well, there we go. I've messed up this toe. There we go. Jericho is a Jewish town, it's in the heart of Judea. And there's a Samaritan with a beaten up Jew on his donkey walking into that town. It's not good. You can imagine it in some of the contexts that, that we're aware of. It's dangerous. It's costly. The question that the listeners would be asking and thinking about this story, does he get out alive? Will this Samaritan with this beaten up man on his donkey, will he get out without himself being killed? If the guy on the donkey had opened his eyes, what would he have said? Get away from me. I'd rather die than be saved by the likes of you. Don't you dare touch me. The Samaritan does what the priest didn't do. He crossed a boundary. He takes a risk. He makes a sacrifice and he takes suspicion onto himself. The 
there we go. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense that you might have. Now, the normal fee for staying in an inn overnight is a twelfth of a denarii. So this Samaritan leaves a generous amount, enough for the guy to stay around about a month. So what we see is that the Samaritan reverses all the wrongs that has been done to the man in the story. The Levite didn't administer first aid. The Samaritan did. The priest didn't put him on his donkey. The Samaritan did. The thieves took his money and left him alone. The Samaritan gives him money and promises to come back. So the way the story is being told, the first section is all about the wrongs that have been done to the man. The middle section is the big surprise. Then the second half is the Samaritan undoing all the wrongs that have been done in the first section. And this is a quote by a um, Kenneth Bailey, a theologian. The robbers hurt the man by violence. The priest and Levite hurt him by neglect. The story implies the guilt of all three. And then the question that is just hanging over the whole story. It's not coming up, but you know it. There it is. Did the Samaritan get out of Jericho alive? We don't know. We're not told. That's the end of the story. And then, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed mercy. Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Now you'll notice the man, the teacher in the law, couldn't even bring himself to say the Samaritan. That's how deep his prejudice went. And Jesus is in fact asking this lawyer, who do you think you are in the story? If you are in this story, which of the characters would you play? If you think you're the priest or the Levite, you're powerful, you're privileged, you're religious, know your shortcomings. You are actually part of the problem. Irresponsible religion is part of the problems in the world. Irresponsible religion is not neutral. It actually needs undoing. It causes harm. So the question is, which Jesus asked the lawyer and he asks us, Who do you think you are in the story? And I think that is the answer we're meant to come up with. Actually, we're the beaten up guy. We need rescuing. And when you need rescuing, you're not picky about who saves you. When you're beaten up by the side of the road, stripped and half dead, you just want somebody to come and help you. This is, I think, another Matthew Henry Uh, an older theologian, we were like this poor distressed traveller. The law of Moses passes by on the other side as having neither pity nor power to help us. But then comes the blessed Jesus, that good Samaritan. He has compassion on us. So just to summarise and to close, what is Jesus teaching us from this story? This is the story of mankind. 
is our story. We are beaten up. The devil is a thief and a robber. The law, what we do, can't save us. You can never do enough to be saved. The man was beaten up by the side of the road, left behind. He couldn't save himself. He couldn't help himself. We can't do that. Religion can't help you. In fact, religion is part of the problem. Morality can't help you. We don't need morality. We need mercy. We need help. We need someone to pick us up and clean our wounds. Someone to carry us. And that person is Jesus. We can't do anything to receive eternal life. We're too beaten up. But so often when we read this story, we think we're the hero. We think we are the good Samaritan. But we're the beaten up guy. It's Jesus who's the hero. The good Samaritan is Jesus. We're the beaten up person. Many of us in this room see ourselves as the powerful guy. We are in the rich West. Either because we're born here or because we've made our way here in some way or another. And we think that we are powerful and that in our minds we're here to help other people. But actually, even in the West, we're the beaten up guy. That's what Jesus is trying to teach the lawyer. What he's trying to teach us, if we have ears to hear. Patience, it'll come. No, it won't. Is there anything there? Yep, no. No. Yes, there we go. Jesus is the unexpected stranger who breaks in from the outside. Jesus is representing the person that we're prejudiced against. If you think of people that you prejudge or groups of people that you prejudge. People that you find difficult. People that you look down your noses at. People that you dismiss. That's Jesus. He saves us at great cost to himself. Is despised even while he is saving us. People don't expect the answer to be Jesus. People can be offended when Jesus bursts into the conversation. For me, it never dreamt to me that the answer to the questions that I was asking was Jesus. I was prejudiced against him for part of my life. It also teaches us that compassion comes at a cost. The guy in the story sacrifices his own stuff. He acts like a servant. He pays the price. He risks his life. He walks into the lion's den. We don't know whether he got out alive. It's left there hanging. Jesus doesn't tell us the end of the story. But we know that Jesus rescues us at a great cost to himself. 
he got killed for doing it. And you can't save people, you can't help people without costing something. Jesus saves at great cost to himself. Substitution. The living one died that dead ones might live. The rich one became poor that poor man might be rich. We need to keep teaching and keep understanding there is a cost. There is a cost paid for us. And then humanity as a victim. Sometimes if you see people in a difficult place, it's very easy to judge them. But at least in this story, the beaten up man wasn't his fault. He didn't do anything to deserve to be beaten up. In Christianity, we have to hold tensions. There's a tension and it's taught of sin as a choice and humanity as being guilty. But we're also taught that sin is a power. The power of sin. And humanity is the victim. And there is a sense, yes, we have choice, but there's also a sense that we are victims. We're victims of the power of sin. And that's different than other religions. It's uniqueness about Christianity. We are victims. We need a saviour. We can't save ourselves. We are powerless. And then finally, humility. It's knowing this. It's knowing what Jesus has done for us that we get the motivation to work with to support, to be involved with people who are different than us it gives us the power to consider others better than ourselves when you see what Jesus has done for us put us on his donkey bathed our wounds, looked after us, then we can't help but do the same for other people. It's told that in the pocket of Martin Luther, when he, would, when he died, they found a piece of paper that he carried around with him. We are all beggars. This is true. And all of this truth that's there in this story, all this truth that Jesus is bringing to us helps us overcome our prejudices. Helps us to love and accept people who are different than us. Because of what Jesus has done for us. And I... We've got a few minutes... When I, as I was praying about this this morning before I, I, I came here, when I, when I felt, there's, I'm sure that God has been speaking and there's things that are there that are helpful for all of us. But I felt particularly just to focus on in terms of response is that sense of sin being a power and us being victims. And I know enough now to know the power of prejudice. So there will be numbers here who have not just been prejudiced to others, but you know that you have been the victim of prejudice yourself. And it's a horrible thing to be, isn't it? To be a victim, to be a victim of prejudice. And I just felt that 
Jesus wanted to come and minister to you now. And in particular, to bandage your wounds, to put you on his donkey, and to strengthen you. And so I would just like to just pray for you. Wendy, if you want to to join me. And if, if you know in your heart of hearts the pain, that sense of you have been the victim of prejudice, do you just want to, to stand and allow the Spirit of God just to come and put, put you on Jesus' donkey and just to bandage your wounds and strengthen you? Is that all right?